It's your fantasy draft, and you're staring at two people that you want, but you just don't know which one to choose. Let's talk about a few of those decisions. Hey, what's going on everybody? Jake, Fantasy Headliners, presented by Roto Baller. Hope everybody is doing well out there in YouTube land. And we're going to just do a little bit of a discussion today. I mean, I don't have a whole lot of notes written down. We just want to talk through a few of these draft day decisions that I'm hearing from a lot of people out there. I get it. I mean, you're in your fantasy draft. It's your turn. You're on the clock. You don't know who to choose. You have two guys sitting there, and you like both of them. Well, I've got a few of those scenarios here that I've heard a lot of the past few weeks. We'll talk through them a little bit, get my take on it, and then feel free to share yours down below. I'll help you guys make those draft day decisions. But let's go ahead and get into the list. All right, first duo we're going to talk about is going to be Julio Jones and Michael Thomas. Now, both of these guys are right there at the end of the first, beginning of the second. So if you have one of those later picks there in the first, this is a decision you're going to have to make. And it's a tough one. It really is. I mean, the knock on Julio Jones all along has been his touchdown production. Is too inconsistent or is just too low? That and his weekly performances are kind of inconsistent also. He may go out there in week three, put up 300 yards and three touchdowns, come out in week four and give you three catches for 36 and make you want to pull your hair out. That's something you just have to deal with with Julio Jones. I do like that they added Calvin Ridley. Calvin Ridley is somebody who is a capable NFL wide receiver who will be on the opposite side or in the slot, and that's something that the defense has to pay attention to. They still have Devontae Freeman and Tevin Coleman in the backfield, which they can't take their eyes off of them either. The only problem with Julio, like we've said before, it's just inconsistencies. But over the past four years, he's averaged over 1,400 yards and six touchdowns. That's wide receiver one all day long. He's just a little bit of a risk. Now for Michael Thomas, it's a little bit different. Thomas is the safer of the two, hands down. He's only played in the league for two years, obviously, being a rookie last year. But over these past two years, he's averaged 1,200 yards and seven touchdowns. Slightly higher on the touchdowns, slightly lower on the yardage. The downfall for Michael Thomas is he's got a little bit more competition for targets. They did sign Cameron Meredith here in the offseason, and if he can come back healthy, he's a great option as a number two wideout in the NFL. They drafted Traquan Smith, who the dude's already turning heads in training camp. They still have Ted Ginn, brought Ben Watson back, who's like, I don't know, 55 years old, but he's still a viable tight end for Drew Brees. They got Alvin Kamara in the back. I mean, there's a lot of weapons in New Orleans. But hands down, Michael Thomas is the number one option in the passing game, and that's not going to change. I mean, the guy's Twitter handle is Can't Guard Mike, and not many people can. It's going to happen again this year. He's got the safe floor of the two. So this is what I'm going to say if you have your decision between Michael Thomas or Julio Jones. If it's your first round pick, and you're picking there at the back half of the first, I'm going with Michael Thomas. He's a little bit safer of a pick. You kind of know what you're going to get with him. He may put up slightly less points in the long run, but at least he's consistent from week to week. Now, if you have one of the earlier picks in the first round, and now you're coming to your second round pick, and they're both sitting there, now all of a sudden I'm leaning Julio Jones. Why? It's because of that upside. You took your safer pick already in the first. Now you want to try to hit the home run and basically get two first round picks. If that happens and Julio Jones hits, you're going to look like a genius. Now, yes, Michael Thomas would still be safer there, but being that you already have that stud in the first round that you drafted, Julio Jones could be the second stud to add to your roster. And to me, hands down, if it's your second round pick, I'm going Julio. Next duo we're going to talk about is going to be Jarek McKinnon and Jordan Howard. They're both right there at the back half of the second, beginning of the third. And if you're in that area, you see them coming up together all the time. But they have question marks. Both of them do, right? I mean, McKinnon... He's kind of getting knocked for his size. He can't take the full workload. Is he a three down back? I mean, we don't know. And that's a question mark we have to ask ourselves. Over the uh, last two seasons, McKinnon's never been the lead guy. But he's averaged 850 total yards and five touchdowns over those last two seasons. But he's never touched the ball more than 200 times. And that's combined passing and rushing. Or receiving and rushing, excuse me. Now, all of a sudden, that number is going to get a dramatic boost. Now, he's not the most efficient runner. But he is in a Kyle Shanahan offense that doesn't have a whole lot of weapons. Pierre Garçon, Dante Pettis, Marquise Goodwin, George Kittle, I like them. But none of them are going to command such a huge target share that they're going to take away from McKinnon. I do like Jarek McKinnon a lot this year, especially if you can get him in the third round. His ADP is starting to creep back up into the second round, and if that's the case, 
I don't know. I'm a little iffy on the second round pick for Jarek McKinnon. If it's a PPR league, I'm a little bit closer to saying okay. But to me, Jarek McKinnon, he's bolted up in the offseason as much as he could. The dude's not very big to begin with. I had the pleasure of talking to him at the NFFC, the National Fantasy Football Convention, a couple weeks back. And he did. He told me. He's like, you know, why would they commit this much money to me if they weren't planning on using me and using me a lot? He chose that that destination because of the, the Shanahan offense. And I don't see it going away. Now, do I want to call him the next version of Devontae Freeman? Kind of. Yeah, I mean, he is. He's going to be a little bit different. He's not quite the same type of runner as Devontae Freeman. But I could see a similar usage to Devontae Freeman. And I like that. Now, for Jordan Howard, Jordan Howard is kind of like the Michael Thomas of running backs right there. He's just a little bit safer for me. He's averaged the last two years 1,200 yards and seven touchdowns. Everybody thinks Tariq Cohen is going to come in this year and take away all the touches from Jordan Howard, and it's not going to happen. Tariq Cohen's going to see an, you know, an increase in touches. They're going to move him all throughout the field. I wouldn't be surprised to see Cohen and Howard in the backfield together. I can see Cohen in the slot, in motion, bubble screens, all kinds of stuff to get Cohen the ball in space. But they're still going to have to run the ball in Chicago. And listen, it's Chicago. It's called the Windy City for a reason. And come the end of the season, when it's cold and snowy and windy, you got to run the ball in Soldier Field. And they don't have anybody better than Jordan Howard to do it. He's going to get the touches again this year. Yeah, he's not going to be too active in the passing game. So he's a little bit higher rated for standard leagues. But he's just safer. And for that exact reason, I'm going Jordan Howard slightly. I mean, it's ever so slightly over Jarek McKinnon. However, if you're in a PPR league, I won't hate you if you go McKinnon uh, over Howard. I just think Howard's upside and his touchdown ability is a little bit higher than McKinnon's at this point. All right, we're going to go back to the end of the first, beginning of the second. And now we're going to talk about Melvin Gordon or Leonard Fournette. Two guys who are not the most efficient runner, I guess you could say. Neither one of them are. They need a lot of touches. But they're going to get a lot of touches in these offenses that they're in. I mean, Gordon, over the past two years, he's averaged 1,450 total yards and 12 touchdowns. And he had 58 receptions last year. So he's involved in the passing game there in Los Angeles. That may slightly change this year. I mean, Mike Williams is back. Mike Williams' back is back healthy, if that makes sense. And he's going to get an opportunity for that wide receiver two role with Tyrell Williams. Now, that doesn't mean that they're not going to just use Melvin Gordon in the passing game anymore. They did get Mike Pouncey from Miami, which is a huge upgrade at center. And they get Forrest Lamp back. So the offensive line gets an upgrade. Now, I've been saying all offseason long that this defense in, in L.A. is hands down one of the tops in the league. Well, they're already starting to get hurt in training camp. Verrett's already down. I saw something with Casey Hayward possibly being injured in training camp, so we have to keep an eye on that. It's it's scary a little bit because if that defense goes down, it kind of bumps down my projections for Melvin Gordon. I expected the Chargers to have a lot of second-half leads this, this year with that defense and having to just run the ball to run up the clock late in games. So if that defense takes too many hits, that's going to change slightly. But all it's going to do is mean that they're going to be throwing more and there's more opportunities for Melvin to catch passes. I really like Melvin Gordon this year. And I get it. He's not the prettiest running back out there, but he puts up good numbers his past few years. For Leonard Fournette, now Fournette is somebody who I think sees a ridiculous amount of touches, probably only short of Zeke this year as far as running the ball. He's not going to go out there and catch you a ton of passes. But he doesn't have a whole lot of competition for carries. There's nobody really there to, to take his spot. TJ Yeldon is next on the depth chart. He'll be more of a third down option. I mean, Fournette's going to have all the goal line uh, work. Jacksonville doesn't have a stud number one wide receiver, but they have a good wide receiver group. And them as a group is going to be more than enough, more than effective to draw the people out of the box, draw the defenders back, and give Fournette the opportunity to to do what he does. And that's just put his head down and run through people. I don't know if you guys saw the interview with Marshawn Lynch a few years ago where he talks about just running through a mother's face. That's what Fournette's going to do, and he welcomes it. Uh, he's exciting to watch. He's fun to watch. He's going to get a ton of opportunities in an offense that heavily favors the run, whose offensive line also got an upgrade uh, with Norwell here in the offseason from Carolina. I mean, great. Sign me up for Leonard Fournette. He's going to be over 1,000 yards, and he's going to get you double-digit touchdowns. Now, which one do I choose? It's going to be a little iffy for me right now, and it's close, but right now I'm going Leonard Fournette just because of the sheer volume that he's going to see that I know that he's going to see. 
Melvin having any type of question marks with the volume bumps him back just a little bit. So for me, if I have to choose between Leonard Fournette and Melvin Gordon right now, I'm going with Fournette. Next duo we're going to talk about is going to be A.J. Green or Devontae Adams. And on paper, it seems neck and neck, but to me, it's really not. Right now, let's start with A.J. Green. And over the past two full seasons that he's played, which is actually 2015 and 17, he's averaged 1,200 yards and nine touchdowns, which is great numbers. He's been somewhat limited by the play of Andy Dalton and the coaching of Marvin Lewis. It's been kind of frustrating for fantasy owners, and I don't really expect that to change too much. I'm really hoping that John Ross gets the opportunity this year. You know, they took him in the first round of last year's draft and didn't really see any of them last year. In fact, I think he ended the year with negative fantasy points, which is impressive, I guess, because I don't know of anybody else that's ever done that. But I'm hoping he gets the opportunity this year, you know, opposite of A.J. Green, at least, if nothing else. It's somebody that the defense has to think about over the top. I mean, John Ross's speed is ridiculous. And if anybody can, you know, be on the opposite side of, of A.J. Green just to take away a defender or make him look a certain direction, is going to do nothing but help A.J. He hasn't had that for a long time. There's nobody there really that's commanding attention outside of A.J. Green. And I'm kind of hoping also that Joe Mixon gets another opportunity this year. If he's given the opportunity, I know we've called him the Le'Veon Bell light of running backs here over the past few months, and it's possible he has that patient running style, but I'm not ready to crown Joe Mixon as a stud running back yet either just because we haven't seen enough of him. I haven't seen the commitment from Marvin Lewis, and I'm still not sold that he's not going to throw in Gio Bernard just enough to irritate all the Mixon owners. But with that being said, A.J. Green is a nice, safe bet at wide receiver. I mean, he's going to get you the 1,000 yards. He's going to get you five to eight touchdowns, almost guaranteed as long as he's healthy. His ceiling is just a little bit capped because of the offense that he's in. Now, Devontae Adams is a different story. Jordy Nelson is out of town in Green Bay, and now it's the Devontae Adams show. They have Randall Cobb still, and they got Jimmy Graham, and Jimmy Graham may steal a few of these uh, red zone touchdowns, But Devontae Adams should have an absolutely enormous year. He's the number one wide receiver in an Aaron Rodgers-led offense who already has huge touchdown upside, but he's yet to play a full season. He's had a few injuries here and there that have been kind of nagging. He's dealt with some concussions, took a big hit in a game last year. I mean, it looked like he was was done for in that game. So he's never been, you know, somebody to play a full season, but he's also never been the number one option in in the, uh, the group either. It's always been Jordy Nelson. So now he gets his chance. He's got 22 touchdowns in his last 29 games that he's played, which is impressive, and that number's only going to go up. He is a lock for me for over 1,000 yards and double-digit touchdowns, and for that reason alone, I'm going with Devontae Adams over A.J. Green. Last group we're going to talk about and is arguably the most important group because it's the earliest in the first round that we've dealt with, it's Saquon Barkley or Alvin Kamara right there in the middle of the first round. They're both going to be sitting there for you, and what do you do? It's a tough question. You see Saquon there, and you see all the college film, and you hear all the things about Saquon Barkley, and you watch the workout videos. The dude looks insane. I mean, he looks like the second coming. Do I want to say Barry Sanders? I'll say the second coming of Barry Sanders. I mean, he looks amazing on film, but we've never seen him play an NFL game. There's been lots of rookie running backs come in that look great on film coming into the NFL and then just didn't really pan out. I mean, look at Trent Richardson and Eddie Lacy. I mean, all these guys that just didn't. Eh. You know, they came in there, they looked amazing. It may have been amazing for a little bit, and then it kind of just faded. Now, I don't think that's Barkley. The guy's talent level looks out of this world, but we just don't know. We haven't seen enough of them. They have Odell Beckham there in the past game with Sterling Shepard and Evan Ingram, and they've improved their offensive line for Barkley. They went and got Nate Solder from New England. They signed Will Hernandez uh, out of the draft that drafted him. I-, I do. They've made a lot of improvements in New York. Now, I know Eli Manning looks like he eats crayons, but he's really not that, you know, dumb. Okay, he's a smart quarterback. He's a Super Bowl winning quarterback, and he has the potential to feed all of these guys and make them all fantasy relevant. Now, is it the safest pick right here with Barkley? Probably not. Only for these unknowns that we just, we don't know. Now, Alvin Kamara is somebody who had a ridiculous season last year, put up 1,500 total yards and 13 touchdowns as a rookie. Now, the only guy that was competing with his touches is gone for four games and Mark Ingram. They come back week five, and then they have the bye week six. So basically, you're not worried about Ingram till week seven. 
And that's a whole lot of Alvin Kamara the first few weeks. Now they're going to use him, and they're going to use him a lot. Yeah, they drafted Boston Scott and went out and got Shane Vereen and Terrence West. But listen, it's going to be the Alvin Kamara show for the first four weeks. But the part that scares me is he was so great last year. I mean, he averaged seven and a half yards per carry last year. And if you think that's going to continue, I want some of whatever you're taking. Because there's no way the dude continues seven and a half yards per carry. That number is going to go down. If that goes down, the rest of the stats go down. And then you're worried about, you know, a huge regression from Alvin Kamara. This is what I'm going to do. And it may sound a little bit crazy to some of you guys, but you never know. Uh, I'm going to take Alvin Kamara right here, and I'll tell you why. Now, the first four weeks, like I mentioned, are probably going to be huge for Kamara. He's going to have all types of touches, 20-plus touches a game for the first four weeks. After those first four weeks, I'm going to take a good long look at my roster. And if I'm lacking anywhere, I'm going to look to trade Alvin Kamara. His value will be so high right then, you'll be able to get almost anything you want to. I'm sure there will be someone in your league more than willing to give you a running back and a wide receiver or, or something like that to bolster your entire roster. And then you don't have to worry about the risk of what happens when Ingram comes back. Do they run him till his legs fall off because they're going to let him walk at the end of the year? We don't know. Does Drew Brees decide he wants to become the Drew Brees of old and they start lighting it up with Cam Meredith and Michael Thomas and Traquan Smith? We don't know. You do know the first four weeks, and you do not want to start off to a slow start in your fantasy league and all of a sudden be playing catch-up after for the first four weeks, which is where you may be with Barkley. He may need a few games to get going. He may need a few games to understand the, the speed of the NFL. We just don't know. I'm going Kamara. I'm not entirely thrilled by it, but I think it gives you a great bargaining chip or a possible RB1 for the rest of the season, depending on how it plans out. All right, so those are a few of these guys that you guys have to debate on early in your drafts. But I know there's a lot of them out there. I could have put in a ton of them in these videos, but then the video takes so long that nobody watches it. So hit me up down below in the comment section. I'm curious to know who you're debating on in your drafts. I'm sure you've been mock drafting by now, and if you are, you can see some of these names popping up together. Throw them down in the comment section. Let's talk about it. Let's help make these decisions a little bit better. Really appreciate you guys. Make sure you guys are liking, commenting, subscribing. Look forward to hearing from you. We'll talk to you later. Thanks.